Hi there, and welcome to Weird Shit Episode 3. Um, this episode I'm going to talk a little bit about volumetrics, but um, rather than really dive into the really technical side of things, I want to show how you can use these really creatively and some of the stuff that you can do with them. So um, let's dive straight into this. Uh, I've got a really simple scene set up here, um, just with some colored cubes, and uh, we have some we have two area lights down here and we have a lot of lighting coming from our HDRI as well. So fairly simple scene, but uh, good enough to show you exactly what you can do. Now, the thing is, uh, most people, when they think about volumetrics, when they want to start volume, they want to start using volumetrics, they generally go into the volume tab over here, add a volume scatter and are sort of done with it. Now, as you can see, I've, uh, I've set my um, computer here back to CPU. Normally I render on GPU, but I wanted to show you, uh, I think most people still run around CPU, what sort of the speed of this kind of thing is. And volumetrics are inherently slow. There are a few little things here and there to tweak them slightly, but to get like drastically better performance, uh, there's only one or two things you can do in certain situations. Most of the time you're stuck with them being fairly slow anyway. So um, I've thrown this volume shader in the um, in the volume slot of the world shader. So I've set my node editor to world here as well to reflect that. And uh, as you can see, it's picking up our lights, but that's about it because if I turn these two area lights off, and again, we're gonna have to wait for it to render, what you'll see is that the scene will turn completely black. So this means our environment texture is not really being utilized when calculating the volume. So this is kind of frustrating because you know, obviously I've got some interesting lighting coming from my HDR and I want that to be picked up as well. So rather than using the volume scatter in here, which I'm going to remove, um, I would for the most part advise against using it in the world slot unless you have very specific reasons to do so. Because I'm going to just reset my cursor here and go back into my uh, camera view and I'm going to add in a round cube. So what I'm going to do is subdivide smooth this just twice very quickly. Um, there we go, and smooth it out. And the reason I prefer doing this is, well, if I move this in just a little bit and scale it up. Now the camera doesn't have to be inside of the volume for this to work. And I go to the object mode in the node editor, I can add a new material. And I'm gonna throw out this diffuse. I'm gonna add in a volume scatter shader. So the same one that we used before in the world slot. And this time I'm gonna hit Shift Z. And as you can see, even with my area lights still um, turned off, we're actually getting scattering. And you can see sort of orange and blue coming from my HDR. It's using the HDR for scattering as well, which is awesome. So we already have a vastly superior setup. And as you can see, it's rendering a lot quicker as well already. So generally, if you're using objects for volumes, I found that it's quite a bit faster and um, it's a lot more efficient to, to use and you can really place your uh, your volumetrics exactly where you want them. So if I were to scale this down, for example, you can see we actually have the volumetrics here and we can do some really interesting things by adding a displace modifier or whatever to this. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna leave it like this. So you can see what it does exactly. It creates a nice sort of volume scattering effect. Now. Before I move on and start diving deeper into this, it's good to understand there's actually three types of volume rendering in Blender right now. And these can all be added together. I'm gonna to show you to them individually to show you exactly what they do. So the second one uh, I'm gonna show you here is the volume absorption. And the volume absorption does sort of exactly that. This is generally used for like tinting glass and other things, um, but I sometimes like to use it for other stuff as well or mix these together for some interesting effects. So if I set the density really high, you'll see that close to the camera, the light is still sort of penetrating through and close to the edge of the object over here. And as you get deeper and deeper in, into the middle of it, it starts to absorb all that light and it gets darker and darker. So what could you use this for potentially? Well, let's say I'll add in an add shader. I'm going to add these two together. And because this is a subtractive shader, um, you'll actually make the correct calculation by adding them together. And as you can see, we still have a volume scatter, but it's almost more like smoke, like 
thick smoke or something that doesn't always let the light shine through. Now we have these two uh, things working together. So one of them is grabbing the light and scattering it through the object, and the other one is absorbing the light as the light penetrates deeper and deeper and deeper. So this way you can get a really interesting look um, going really quickly compared to just the volume scatter, for example, which is really bright and grabs all the light and scatters it through and through and through. So that's one, one thing you can do with it. And um, another interesting thing is, let's say I'm gonna add a noise texture here. So for both the volume scatter and absorption, you can tint these uh, if you want to. I'm not gonna tint them. Uh, there's no need to do that in the tutorial. Color slot sort of speaks for itself and the density so far as well. But as you can see, we can attach stuff to this. So I'm gonna add in a quick object production here and Another thing that is um, really handy when you're using object as volumes is, let's say I wanna add this texture into the density to create some, um, some difference in density there. Uh, I can actually preview it because it's an object, so I can get an idea of the scale of my noise and what it's gonna look like. So let's say I distort it quite a bit, make it look a little bit weirder, and I'm gonna squash it down, there we go. Maybe make it a little bit bigger again. Something like that, it's just an idea. And I'm gonna add in a color ramp in between. And I'll hook this up to the density here and the density here. So when I delete this viewer now and I go back in, hopefully we can see it, but probably not just yet. If I bring this color ramp in, I'm gonna really, really increase the contrast so we get uh, a very visible, visible effect going on here. and. One of the things you might notice is the moment I introduced this texture, everything started getting really, really, really slow. Now, if you're using textures um, and you have a volume that has different densities, this is what's called a heterogeneous volume compared to one that has just fixed densities all the way through, which is called a homogeneous volume. Now, when you're dealing with a heterogeneous volume, there's um, the volume sampling over here actually has effect. So. Generally, if, you're, if you have the same density throughout the entire volume, these step sizes and max steps really aren't gonna do that much. Yet, if I increase them here, let's say if I increase my step size to five and I decrease my max steps a little bit, you can see it's rendering a lot quicker already. So when you're working with textures and stuff inside of your volumes, this is where you're gonna to wanna to start tweaking and, uh, and doing things. Now it's good to know that the step size, uh, as much as you increase the step size, you're gonna start losing finer and finer detail um, the bigger the step size gets. So depending on your scene, you're gonna to have to tweak and re-render and sort of compare and see what you can get away with, uh, with those. But as you can see, with the step size set to five, we're already going a lot quicker. And after 30 seconds, we have a fairly decent image. If we set the step size back to 0.1, which I believe is the default, I'm not sure if I change it in my defaults. You can see to do just the first pass, it takes forever. We're already rendering about 10 seconds now and we're nowhere near, nowhere near uh, when we set the step size higher. So I set this back to five and there we go. Now, I said there were three main methods of doing volume shading in Blender. We've seen two now. We've also seen how we can actually bring those together. The third one is actually the emission shader. So that can be used as both a surface and a volume shader, which is really cool. And basically what happens if I pipe this into the volume, you'll see you get a emissive volume. So you can do some really interesting things because uh, you can still add other shaders to it. So let's say um, grab a glass shader on top of this and throw this into the surface slot. Maybe increase the index of refraction, bring down the color a little bit. Again, I'm just messing around. But you can get these really nice sort of glowing glass globes uh, if that's something you really like, if that's something you're into. And again, if I increase the strength here, you sort of still get some of the reflections of the environment and of the, the other stuff next to it, but it's sort of glowing glass. Um, so it's another interesting effect that you can do, but mainly these are the three shaders that you can use uh, for volume shading. Now, uh, keep in mind again, anything that you do uh, in volume compared to surface, a surface emission shader is always gonna render a little bit faster than a volume emission shader, but that's just the nature of volumetrics to start with. So, 
With that done, uh, I'm going to go back to a regular one here, and you can even have a glass ball with all of this stuff in it, which is really cool because you create like a crystal ball effect or, or something like that, um, which has all the volume scattering inside of it. I'm going to delete it for now, as well as the emission, and focus back on this. So with that being said and done, um, there's one other thing that I really want to show you as well, uh, and that's... For that, I'm going to turn on these area lights again, and again, once we turn them on, you can see they're being picked up by the volume. We get different sorts of shadows and other things. Um, before I show that one last thing, the step size, uh, if you're using, for example, fire and smoke, um, that has different densities in it coming from the simulation, so the step size will work on that as well. And um, if you go into, let's see, quick effects over here, I believe it is quick uh, smoke, and you have an object selected, it will create a really nice shader for you that you can have a look at, and it uses volume scatter and absorption with different densities in it as well. Um, and you can pull that one apart and see, see what it works like. Um, so for the last bit, last thing I wanna talk about here, so I'm just gonna focus on just the volume scatter shader, and I'm gonna take away the density here. So we have just the shader, and here you see it's really bright uh, because it's got quite a big density. So the last thing here is the anisotropy, and the reason I want to talk about this is I use this quite a lot for artistic effect. Now, um, the values go from minus one to one, and I believe in the manual it's described as something like um, it changes the directionality of the scattering. Now, what does this actually translate to? Generally, I don't really go into the minus values. I use the uh, zero to one values, but obviously you can use whatever you want. But if I set this to like 0.975, for example, so very, very close to one, you'll see that um, it gets a certain sort of directionality to it, as the name suggests, but it translates into having sort of a fog glow or maybe sort of a weird filter that you've put in front of your lens or something. And you can get some really, really cool effects with this. Now, bear in mind, uh, I've noticed if you're changing the anisotropy here, uh, you're going to get pretty pretty noisy renders. You're going to really have to bump up the samples to get a really nice end result, um, unfortunately. But hey, that's just the way it is. Uh, you know, any sort of volume effect is going to be going to be hard to render, no matter what your system is. So um, I can set this to negative 0.9, for example. And uh, you'll see it does sort of, I guess, the opposite. Technically, it's doing the opposite, but visually, it's a little harder to describe what the effect is of the negative values um, than of the positive values. But again, like I said, if I go to like a really extreme value like 0.995, you'll see the scattering almost disappearing, but you get this really big glow around your lights, and your light sources actually become visible, and uh, you get really, really interesting results. So you never know what you could use this for. But um, another thing I like about it is if I turn the camera here, and this might take a little bit longer to render, um, if you can actually see your environment, so if I turn this transparent off for a second, you can see that it's grabbing the colors of the environment, and almost um, the closer you get to one, the more like one-to-one -one ratio it is, uh, projects them through the mist, which is really cool, because this way, if I just go into my front view, you can see I can create these really, really interesting color scapes just by using the HDR in the back and letting it bleed through the uh, volume scatter with this setting over here. So again, these are things to consider. Um, obviously, you can do some stuff to tweak uh, your volumetric settings. I've noticed that it sometimes helps a little to bring down the amount of bounces over here, which you know generally helps with any, any type of faster rendering. Um, don't forget the step size and max steps only work if you're working with different densities within the same shader. Um, another thing that can help as well is reducing the max bounces of the um, HDRI, especially if it's bleeding through. It can get a little bit darker then, but sometimes you can get uh, slightly faster results. Again though, don't expect any miracles. Um, I've bumped my rig down to, to CPU uh, on, on a couple less cores than, than the full thing, just to show you on average what it would be on, I guess, a similar quad-core um, type computer. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's not super fast. Now, if you want that sort of volumetrics effect, um, but you don't want to spend the render time on it, there's one last thing that you can do, and uh, that's actually enable your mist pass over here in your passes. Ooh. 
if I can actually click it, and you can set it up over here on the world tab and tell it how far it stretches. So I usually have it start from zero from the point of the camera that it views, and then the depth of it, um, you can uh, turn on and off, or sorry, you can change according to the depth of your scene or whatever you can see through your camera view. So I'm just gonna turn off the volume here and render this really, really quickly. And now that it's done rendering, um, have a look at the mist pass here. And as you can see, this is something that you could use in compositing. So if I just bring in my image very quickly, uh, where's our UV image editor, there we go. And I set this in the compositor and use the nodes. Then um, now we're seeing the final output of our compositing. And uh, what we can do is add a mix node over here, or you can do this in After Effects or whatever, uh, whichever application you want. And add this mist into the second slot and then factor it in or out. So you can get mist without actually using volumetrics. I wanted to show this as well. Um, you know, if you're on a time limit or you just need it for a certain scene, uh, this can add fake volumetrics into your scene as well. So with that being said, um, this was more about rendering them in camera. So if I go back to my 3D view and pull this up a little bit, we have the volumetrics here and we can still use the density in here as well. And it'll work even with the anisotropy and all that kind of stuff. So that's, I guess, most of what I wanted to say on it. Um, again, like I said, a lot of people tend to spend a lot of time trying to really optimize this stuff. There's a few things that you can do, but volume scattering, unfortunately, is just a really, really slow effect um, in most render engines anyway. But there you go. Uh, there's an idea of the three types of volume rendering that you can do and um, yeah, some of, this, some of the cool stuff that you can do with it. Again, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you next time. And if you're still watching, here's one last little bonus thing that I forgot to say. Um, if you're using a color ramp for the density, for example, and you want the volume scatter density or the volume absorption density to be a little bit higher, what you can always do is add in a math node, set it to multiply, and that way you can have the volume scatter, let's say, twice as dense as the volume absorption or 10 times as dense or whatever. And you can sort of balance between these two, even with the texture um, in there. So, all right, that was a quick little, little extra thing. And as a second little addendum uh, that I hadn't thought about when I recorded this first, um, obviously volume scatter is great for clouds and that kind of thing. So I've created a very, very simple cloud here um, and a very simple shader. And uh, yeah, there's gonna be a link in the description for, the, for this file. So you can download the whole file and mess with it. Um, you'll see the everything's in here, the, the thing we were doing earlier as well. So yeah, feel free to mess around with that as well. And uh, that's it.